Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the um, Bug Blitz Meet the Experts program for Bug Fest. We are excited to have you here today. Uh, we are going to be talking about bugs just in general, uh, insects, not technically all bugs, uh, so all insects and other arthropods. And we are going to talk about iNaturalist a little bit as well. Um, I hope that some of you have had a chance to participate in the Bug Blitz this week and are contributing great information about which insect species we have in our state during Bug Fest this year. Uh, there have been a lot of great things that have been coming through, and we'll take a look at that here in a little bit. But I want to introduce the people who are leading the session today first. Um, my name is Chris Goforth. I'm the head of citizen science at the museum. And it is my job to connect people with science research opportunities that they can have regardless of their level of experience with science. And so things like the bug blitz are a way to get everyone involved in science because there are a lot of scientists that are using the um, the information that is shared on iNaturalist in their research. If you had a chance to watch the video that we posted earlier this week, uh, there was an example in there of a um, group of dragonfly researchers that did a study based on our naturalist data, at least they started their study. And so there really are people out there that are using this kind of information. So we're excited to, to chat today. Um, I'm going to ask Matt for you to introduce yourself next. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Matt Bertone. I'm an entomologist at NC State University. Uh, and my uh, interests are in arthropods in general, so uh, insects, mites, spiders, all that stuff. And I uh, professionally, I actually identify insects professionally, so and critters like that. So hopefully, I can help. I'm curious to see everyone's stuff and really interested. Yeah, Matt's amazing and knows so much about so many things. So um, really happy to have him here today. Uh, Adam, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, my name is Adam Prince. Um, I'm by no means an expert, but I love bugs. I've grown up catching and identifying stuff. Um, took some entomology classes and stuff like that at State. Um, but I'm mainly here to talk about Eco Explore and uh, getting uh, younger people involved in citizen science as well. All right, last we've got Bonnie. Hey everybody, my name is Bonnie Emick. I work at Prairie Ridge Eco Station, which is part of the Museum of Natural Sciences um, in West Raleigh. And I am not an entomologist, but I do really, really like bugs. And all this week I have gone outside even in my backyard, um, just looking under my porch light and in my leaves of my trees. And I have found some really cool stuff that would have been overlooked if I hadn't gone looking for them. So that's why I really love a project like this um, because you never know what you're gonna find. You might find something really cool. All right. So this is your um, group of panelists for today. Um, I am also an entomologist by training. I have a, a master's degree in entomology. I uh, studied aquatic insects um, and was working towards a PhD when I changed my mind about what I wanted to do and came to the museum instead. Um, <laughs> and so uh, here I am. Um, I, I do not know as much about how to identify insects as much, but uh, I know a lot about behaviors and things that people see insects doing. And so, um, Hopefully we can help you out with some identification. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask everyone was um, why something like iNaturalist is a good resource for you personally. So if you have any sort of like experience with iNaturalist, like why you like it, if there's anything you get out of it personally. Would any of you like to comment on that first? Um, so one of my, I wear lots of hats. Some of us wear lots of, have lots of different job responsibilities in our job. Um, and one of the big hats that I wear is education. Um, so I often am leading a group around um, and we come across something. Now it could, it could be a plant or, you know, maybe not a bug, but often a bug, an insect or, or arthropod of something. And I'm able to pull out my phone and um, figure out what that 
that is, even though I might know it, I might not know it right off the top of my head. It gives us the tools to actually learn together out in the field and for me to learn um, because I might not remember all the details to go look it up later. And then we get to share it all together. The other thing that I use it for as an educator is, um, for example, monarchs, they're a migratory species. Um, when I see a first, my first monarch in the spring when they're making their migration up north, I take a picture. Um, and when I see them really coming back down south, I take another picture. And then I'm able to go back into my own ob observations and go, when was that? Um, if I want to plan a program around them, is this the right time? Am I planning? Oh, I'm two weeks off. I need to wait a little bit uh, according to trends. I can also look up those trends and see if they're about the same. So I really like that. I have that at my fingertips that I know the data, the trends that are happening in the location where I'm working and in my yard. Um, I know exactly when I saw that where I'm at. So both of those are really cool to have um, to, to participate in that research and see it for myself. Adam, you want to say something about how you use iNaturalist? Yeah, I was going to say basically the same thing Bonnie said. I use it to track um, what's in my area. Um, if, I, if I see something, um, it can help you identify the things you find. But you can also look in, around your area and see, oh, this is the kind of bug that I have in this area. Um, so it's usually really useful for helping to identify stuff, keep track of what's around you. Um, and um, like Bonnie said, it tracks trends. So you can see when things are moving, when things first show up, or when things stop showing up. Um, so I, I think it's super useful for just learning what's around me and uh, using that for programs. Right, I feel the same way that you two do about it. Um, I, and I know, Matt, you probably get, do you get photos that people send to identify things? Uh, on a naturalist? You mean people asking me or? Or either through iNaturalist or do people send you photos just in general? Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, um, in our clinic, we have uh, we do uh, charge fees for physical samples, but we offer free identification of image samples. So uh, they're not probably as good as the iNaturalist stuff necessarily, because I think in iNaturalist people want to take photos of these things, whereas where I get I I get people having issues with things, and so yeah. <laughs> Well, I know uh, once you tell people that you're interested in bugs and you have some sort of knowledge about them, people tend to send you just so many photos. Like every person you've ever known that has your phone number will text you photos of insects um, and people will send you photos of insects on Facebook and there's so many people that want to know so many things about insects. And so I, I really like things like iNaturalist because of that. The image recognition algorithm in it in particular is a really, really great identification tool to at least narrow down your options. And so it's a way that you can figure out what something is really quickly and easily and for free um, without necessarily having to, you know, send your friendly neighborhood in small just a picture of something that they don't know. Um, you know, there's over a million species of insects in the world. We don't know all of them, that's for sure. Uh, Matt knows way more than most people do, which is Really impressive. <laughs> um, all right, so um, I do want to show off the um, current bug blitz results. So I'm going to share my screen here really quickly and um, hold on, let me switch back over to the iNotch list page here. Uh, so I just want to show you what we've kind of accomplished together so far in our bug blitz. So here we are, um, this is our page for our, our, our event, which goes through tomorrow. And so you still have time to participate and take some photos of insects and submit them uh, through tomorrow if you'd like to. So we have um, 2,835 observations right now of 763 species. And I really think this is a pretty amazing result for a few days in the fall where it rains a bunch of days um, during that time and it's starting to cool off a little bit more. Um, like today is not going to be a very warm day so we'll see how these numbers change today. Um, but you can see all these different kinds of things that people have submitted. So there's um, lots of these different animals that people are seeing. So we've got a lot of caterpillars, 
got a lot of moths, um, some flies. And then you can also see here where people are seeing these things. So the people that are really participating heavily are in the mountains in Charlotte and in the Triangle and the Triad, which tends to be kind of what you see in North Carolina. And then we've got this whole section out here where people are not doing as much. Um, so I'd love to see more out in this area if possible. Um, but hopefully we'll fill in a little bit more of this. But I feel like these are pretty good numbers since since Monday that we're we're getting this many people involved. Um, and there are 818 people that have submitted photos um, to iNaturalist of insects and other arthropods in North Carolina um, since Monday. All right. Um, so I was hoping that everyone would be willing to share a really cool um, iNaturalist observation that they've made recently. Well, does anyone have one they want to share? And people in the audience, you are welcome to share them as well. You can put a link to your iNaturalist observation in the chat and we'd be happy to uh, share it with everyone so that we can see them. I have something cool that I found, but I haven't put it on iNaturalist yet. So I'm going to do that real quick and then I'll put a link in. <laughs> All right. I, I have some from recently. Might be cool, but if anybody else Let's just share while, I, while I'm looking it up. Well, I think I've got mine um, handy, so maybe I'll share mine first. Um, I've got this fly. Since this year's Bug Fest theme is flies, I figured I should share a fly. Um, this is a really cute little hover fly. They're really small um, and a little bit inconspicuous, but these are one of those flies that kind of hover um, frequently kind of near your face in my experience um, <laughs> and they're really great at just kind of staying in one place in the air which I think is a really cool behavior that they do. Matt do you know much about these this particular species or closely related ones? Yeah so um, this is a really common one a uh, small uh, genus Toxamirus there's a, there's a good little key on bug guide uh, made by a friend of mine, Martin Hauser, about the few species that are here around. So they can, you know, if you go take a look there, you can probably help identify yourself and, you know, post a guess and see if you're right. Um, but these are uh, one of the ones that have larvae that are aphid feeders. So they, they're actually beneficials. They, their larvae are kind of like little legless caterpillars that are crawling around on plants uh, feeding on aphids. So that's why they're so common around. I always think the larvae of these look kind of like just like little bags of goo, honestly. They don't look like anything, but then they're running around, well, not exactly running around, oozing around, uh, eating so many other things, which is really kind of cool to watch. You watch them just like grab an ethan and pull it inside, and it's the only way you can really tell that they're actually alive. <laughs> I have photos actually from out in front of the museum from a while ago, a long time ago, uh, on the milkweed. So uh, the milkweed out in front of the old part of the museum uh, attracts a lot of things, obviously. And uh, I have some photos of some hoverfly larvae feeding on the oleander aphids, those bright yellow with black leg aphids. Uh, and it's amazing because those hoverflies have no legs, no way to catch them. So they just crawl up and they kind of suck their mouth parts onto them. And, you know, I have one photo of it just raising it up in the air with them with the mouth hooks in it. So they're pretty crazy. Happily, aphids don't move around a whole lot, so that makes it a little, a little easier to eat. <laughs> I, I put my uh, blue-faced uh, meadowhawk Ooh, yes. in the chat. So it's a, it's a really cool dragonfly. I've never seen one like this before, and uh, Chris is the one to help me uh, identify it. Um, I've never seen a red dragonfly. It's small, too. It's, it's only a couple inches long. Um, but Chris and, and Matthew could talk more about them. I don't know much about them, except that they're uncommon, uh, but they're more common in the later in the fall, I think. Um, and I think these guys specialize in, um, they grow up like in pond, in uh, puddles, as opposed to like more established areas of water. They're neat. I like them. This is Chris's domain. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know anything big and pretty, so... <laughs> So, 
Uh, some of your flies are awesome, though. Uh, yeah, meadow hawks are not very common in North Carolina. We do have multiple species of them. The only one that's really regularly seen by a lot of people are the autumn meadow hawks, which should start be coming out, uh, or should start coming out fairly soon. So um, you might see a few more of these smaller red dragonflies, which are just not not as obvious, not as common in this state as they are in some other parts of the country. Um, this one I hadn't ever seen before, so I was really excited that Adam saw this, and he saw it at Prairie Ridge as well, so we can add it to the species list for Prairie Ridge. Um, we have a lot of species of dragonflies and beautiful flies at Prairie Ridge, and I'm always very excited to add more. So, um, Dragonflies are, of course, really great for eating little insects um, that you might not want to have around, so they're eating things like mosquitoes and black flies and um, noceums and a lot of other biting insects, but they can also eat a lot of other insects you might want a little bit more. I mean, they can eat butterflies and bees and things like that as well, but um, they're really valuable for kind of controlling the number of other individuals of other species. That's such a great observation, Adam. I really love this one. <laughs> it was worth standing in a fire ant nest to get this picture. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pull up Bonnie's. Ooh, that one's a great one. I like that one. All right, so here's Bonnie's. Yeah, so I found this late last night. I'm sure the timestamp is on here. Um, I don't know what it is yet. All I know is it's a weevil and it's got a really, I'm going to call it a really long nose. Tell me what the real word for that is. What is that? I think rostrum? Is that, is that right, Matt? Mm -hmm. That's what I would call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure that I've ever seen one that long. Weevils do have really long rostrums. I always call them noses. Um, but I personally had not ever seen one. I mean, if, if you can see that is the same length of his body. So I was just fascinated by that. So hopefully um, somebody can narrow it down uh, past the genus. It looks like it's to genus. Yeah. Um, I, suggested the genus here. So <laughs> yeah. So uh, you're probably not going to have any luck getting a species on that, unfortunately. Uh, it's uh, I've even with specimens in front of me, uh, it's it's very difficult to ID the species of Curculio. Uh, they um, this is probably, um, I think it's a female maybe, it's hard to say, but the, the, you, there's the key that came out, there's a key that came out fairly recently that's really good, but still, even with the specimens in front of you, it's like little tiny judgment calls. So I'll be curious if somebody, you know, can give you a species ID, but it's, it's one of those tough groups sometimes from photos. Very cool. I do like that you provided so many different angles mm -hmm. though. That's it. A great way to get a better ID for an insect, um, especially on something like Arnachulus, because a lot of times you need to see the front, the side, and the top, and, and ideally the bottom. We never get the bottom in Arnachulus, um, but it's it, great to have multiple angles for a lot of insects if you can. Yeah. Definitely, the specialists love that because yeah, and so that's definitely good, uh, uh, good uh, advice for everyone posting. Yeah, if, if you can get the insect to stay still enough or be in one place enough. Um, I also want to point out, because I know we have, um, people are learning iNaturalist. You'll see that I took a picture of this and I labeled it as true weevils. Um, even if you don't know that it was a weevil, um, when you upload an a mm -hmm. observation to iNaturalist, it'll often give you a suggestion. And sometimes that suggestion is just... Um, for example, this one gave me a suggestion to the family. Um, sometimes it's not even that close. <laughs> and very often, if I'm really not sure, like I've got some caterpillars I've seen this week that I've just loaded as Lepidoptera, which is the order of butterflies and, um, and moths. And I've uploaded it just that way. I've uploaded things that just says, plants. Um, and people can go in and you can see that two users down on the bottom have, um, since I put true weevils, have narrowed it down to a genus. And like Matt said, I guess that's as far as I'm going to get. But still, um, I went from not, I, I knew it was a weevil and that's all I knew. And uh, at least it's narrowed down a little bit. Um, so that's one of the other great things about this project. Yeah, and um, I would add that uh, don't be afraid to put it in the wrong group because there are people who follow uh, these families, so they'll they'll get a notification when somebody posts that family. 
and they'll look and they'll say, oh, I know what this genus is, or they'll say, oh, no, that looks like a weevil, but it's actually something else, and um, and they'll try and get it to the right place. So uh, even if it's wrong, it'll at least uh, kind of spur um, some kind of identification. And um, before we do another one, is it okay if I take some questions out of the chat? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so a question that was asked a while ago is, are all monarch butterflies orange? I think the answer is yes. I've seen some really pale ones. Is there a species of monarch that isn't orange? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, the monarch is a very specific species. It's uh, Aeneas perplexus. So, um, you know, that, that, that species. Um, do you happen to know about, are there any closely related species to monarchs that are different colors that would look similar? You know, I'm trying to think of it again. Butterflies are not my domain as much. Um, they're too popular. But uh, let's see. So, yeah, of course, you get the viceroy, which is, looks uh, is a mimic. Um, and then there's the queen, which is in the same genus uh, as monarch. And it's, I think, a little bit darker. Uh, but they're all kind of brown or orangish color. They're not, you know, none, none of them are kind of crazy blues or anything that I, that I know. But, um, yeah, I don't have a lot of I'm not uh, very good with butterflies. <laughs> I will say I was in Texas a year or two ago and um, I saw this orange butterfly fly by me and I went, that's not quite a monarch, but it almost is. And I was able to use iNaturalist to find it. I find out it was a queen monarch, which I had never seen before. Um, so that was really cool. Um, and the other question that is in the chat is how do I upload to this project? Chris, do you mm -hmm. want to talk about that? Yeah, uh, so if you're on iNaturalist, all you need to do is upload any arthropods at all in North Carolina between Monday and tomorrow, and they will automatically go into the project. And so it will automatically gather things for you, so you don't have to specifically specify this project or anything. Uh, and so, um, yeah, just download the app, or you can use the website to upload your insect and other arthropod photos, and you'll be able to get them into the system very easily. And I don't know the answer to this one either. What do weevils eat? All right. Okay, so I was going to type in the chat, but uh, so yeah, this, this genus actually is a pretty famous one. It includes a few uh, pests, including the pecan weevil um, and uh, the acorn weevils, things like that. So they'll chew they use their long uh, rostrum to chew a little hole in it, uh, in the nut when it's developing and lay their egg in there. And then the legless larvae, a grub, is going to live its life inside that nut. And so if you ever see under a pecan tree a bunch of dropped pecans that have holes in them, uh, what's actually pretty crazy is these huge larvae squeeze out of this tiny little hole to get out and pupate. But uh, they can be a big pest of pecan and other uh, tree nuts. Um, and uh, I don't know if curculio feeds on anything else, but typically it's gonna be tree nuts that they feed on. But weevils in general feed on all different types of things. Sorry, I should say plants. They're basically all plant feeders, but all different types of plants. All right, someone in the chat mentioned the very large lover grasshoppers in Central Florida. I have seen those. They are amazing. Um, I'm from Arizona originally. This is Bonnie, actually. Um, and we have very large lover grasshoppers there, too, that are really closely related to those. And uh, they're impressive. I love them. Are those the same okay, ones? Gonna... Oh, good. From the times I visited Florida, there, every time I go up, there's like, these big piles, basically, of of nymphs, and they're these like black with these like uh, orange or red or yellow stripes down them. Um, they get really, really big. Is that is that what those are? I don't actually know. Like yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, those are really cool. They look like uh, like I don't know, a fantasy insect. Like if, if if a seven year old got to draw and make an insect, it'd be that because it just looks super cool. They're also the ones that uh, people dissect in science classes, typically. Oh, I was just going to say the same yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're going to dissect an insect, it's going to be one of those big lovers. All right, we had someone in the chat uh, share a link to a cool bug. Um, so let me uh, switch over to that really quickly, just so we can take a look at it. 
This one here. Ooh, that's a favorite of mine. This is really pretty. I, I done beetles. They're they're awesome. I love them. Do you know anything more about these that you can share, Matt? Yeah, so I studied dung beetles for my master's, actually. So, um, and I reared these guys uh, and girls. Um, these, uh, this is one of the most beautiful beetles um, and uh, around. And actually, we have uh, three species of Phanias around here. Uh, one is uh, one of my favorite triangulars because it's not so uh, bold. It's more bluish. It can be metallic blue and black. Uh, but uh, and you find that no, more near the coast. But Vindex is really common around uh, across the East Coast. Uh, it's the most widely spread one around here. And uh, they will actually, as pairs, uh, bury uh, chunks of dung and in the soil build a little chamber and roll the dung into a ball inside, inside the chamber. They're not a rolling dung beetle, so they just bury the dung right underneath it. And what they'll do is they'll actually coat the dung ball in some soil and lay an egg in the soil. Uh, right outside the dung ball and they have fairly big grubs you know the grubs are kind of like a typical white 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 grub that would be inside that dung ball but they have uh, major males this is a major male it's got that huge horn uh minor males have a much smaller horn and less uh kind of angular uh pronotal parts the little triangular part and then females have no horn at all and they're they're more a little bit more rounded and bulky so it's a great species I actually have some hair clips made out of some specimens of these that I really love. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that make jewelry out of dead insects that they find, uh, which I think is this really weird little niche market, but um, people like me buy them. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great beetle. I love them. So do they have, um, do the dung beetles specify on a particular type of dung usually, or do they, are they kind of generalists as far as the the dung they prefer? Yeah, so that's uh, that it depends really. So some of them are very generalist. Uh, often the ones you've come that come to cattle dung or or things like that are going to be fairly generalist. Um, we have a few. There's a bunch of uh, introduced species, exotic species that are here in in the U.S. In fact, when I did my studies, the mo the most common one, uh, Anthophagus taurus which has bull horns is the major males uh, is from Europe. And uh, it's like made up 65% of what I caught out in cattle pastures. But if I was trapping in the forest with squirrel dung, you'd get some little dung beetles that are specific to squirrels. There's some specific to, for instance, there's one that's specific to gopher tortoises and then gopher tortoise burrows. And there's even a few that have kind of left the dung food habit uh, and uh, feed on fungi uh, in the stems of, mushrooms and things like that. And also uh, there's one really cool big roller that often feeds on uh, uh, carrion. So it'll, it'll mash up some dead meat and uh, feathers and things like that and roll it into a ball. So they're, they're pretty variable. And uh, when I did my studies, I collected uh, 30 different species in cattle pastures across North Carolina. So there, there's some really tiny pill-like ones that don't, do, don't look really impressive. And then these Phanias Vindex was just one of the more impressive ones. All right, so Matt, you shared a, a photo earlier of one that you liked from recently. So I'm gonna switch over to that really quickly so we can take a look. This one here, I've seen these before, they're really cool. Yeah, it's, it's a great one. It's, um, that's a tricky one for, you know, if you've seen it for the first time, it, it looks like a stag beetle, but it's actually a longhorn beetle. Um, uh, and longhorn beetles, if you know them, they typically have really long antennae and are much different looking than this group. But this is a subfamily, has a couple of species around here, um, and uh, they just look very different than other longhorn beetles. So it's a favorite of mine just because it's so odd. You can also tell from looking at this that Matt is a very expert photographer. Um, <laughs> Most photos on iNaturalist will not be as good as those, which is just fine. But it also takes me forever to post anything on iNaturalist then, because i got to process them and do all that stuff. 
Yeah, I have different standards for my good photos and my INET <laughs> photos most of the time. <laughs> All right, um, Bonnie posted one earlier I want to take a look at. Wait, hold on, we already looked at yours. Um, I was going to pull up this other one by, by Matt really quickly. These are pretty awesome looking. What can you tell us about these? Yeah, these are these are one of my favorite flies, even though they're not, you know, they don't do anything really cool necessarily. But um, these are minute black scavenger flies uh, and they're really tiny. Um, they uh, they can fit through a window screen. They're very, very tiny flies. But I had a massive amount of them emerge or I don't know where they came from in my uh, workshop. And so these were just sitting on my door in huge groups uh, of mating pairs. And so you can see that those are all. I think there's, yeah, there's an even number. There's all mating pairs right there and they, they mate back to back. And uh, oftentimes the male will be upside down and there's actually pictures where the female is just dragging the male around uh, and he just kind of is along for the ride. Uh, and those larvae develop in, uh, in compost uh, bins and um, in uh, under, uh, you know, in rotting wood and stuff like that. They're just general um, decaying matter feeders. But very cute little flies, I think. When you look at them up close, they're very, they got little tiny mouth parts. They got cute little antennae and really uh, pretty wings. So my new black scavenger flies, can I take it they're scavenging? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, uh, that's typically what they do. Um, I forget what else they, there's probably some weird life histories. Uh, a lot of these uh, scavenging flies will sometimes also be associated with ants in the in the refuse parts. You know, when the ants get rid of their trash, these flies like to eat it, just like our trash. But uh, yeah, these these are around. It's just they're so small that most people probably don't notice them. So when you say small, are these like a millimeter, two millimeter, or something like that? Yeah, they're about two millimeters long or so. They're uh, here. I was, uh, I don't know if I have privileges to share. You should. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find. Oh, here's a. Here's an interesting one. This is an interesting life history photo I took um, of ones on my compost bin. And you can see they're mating, of course. They always mate. It seems like I always find them mating. Uh, but this ant has grabbed one of their legs. Uh, and they also want a mite is riding on one of them. Um, and so mites are very common on flies and other insects around compost. They ride around on the insects to get to other sources of compost where they can feed on nematodes and little tiny insect larvae. Uh, but you can see, okay, so this is a, this is a, um, an, uh, an what is it, odorous house ant, which is the common little ant that gets in your house. And you can see how tiny these flies are then compared to them. And then, uh, one of my yeah, favorite. Mite, like the size of its thorax. I know it's it's insane how tiny they are. And then uh, real quick, I think I have I have a photo of one on um, a window screen. Or again, another mating pair. Of course, it's it's always mating pairs up. Oh, I can't find it, but that's all right. But so yeah, you can see how tiny they are compared to that ant. But I like the yeah, tiny but... things again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know you did. But it's great. It's good to have people that like the tiny things because most people focus on the really big things, and so we don't we don't see them as much, and we don't know as much about them. Um, so it's it's good to know that there are people out there that are looking at the little things too. Uh, I know, in I'm really into moths, and the micro moths um, are like this whole different population of people compared to the people that like the big moths. Sorry, my dog. Um, and speaking of moths, there was someone that posted in the chat um, this observation of a, a very pale luna moth. That's a really, really pale one, um, but very beautiful. Yeah, I, I like the micro moths too. I, I do love Saturnids, the silk moths like uh, luna moths and such, especially the larvae. I, you know, I'm really into, of course, the larvae of insects too, because they don't get as much appreciation either. But man, even, you know, these, 
these are really impressive and some of my favorites uh, of the mods. Yeah, it's hard not to appreciate a Luna Moth. They really are spectacular. I know they're one of the most popular ones, but they're they're gorgeous. So it, it's really hard not to like one. One of my favorites. Uh, we did get a question about what our favorite bugs are. Ooh. It's impossible, right? <laughs> I mean, there's is. so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's some, there's way too many to pick from. Well, if you come to my talk at eleven, I'll uh, I'll be talking about my a few of my favorite flies. But let's see, other than flies, what is my favorite? Uh, oof, that's tough. I have an exact one favorite insect. Oh. Which is the wandering glider dragonfly, which is my favorite because it flies across oceans under its own power. So it's found on every continent on our planet except Antarctica because it's too cold for dragonflies in Antarctica um, because it has flown there itself. And so there's a lot of pictures that you'll see these days in the era of social media, of like cargo ships and container ships and things out in the middle of the ocean where just thousands of these dragonflies land on their, their ship out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I just think it's the coolest thing they're thought to have one of the longest animal migrations in the world because uh, they're they're doing a migratory path from India to Africa and back, um, which is pretty impressive for an insect that's only you know this big. <laughs> I, let's see. I have a favorite moth I can show you, or one of my favorite moths. Excellent. This uh, again. This is one of my. This one was cool because it wasn't apparently it wasn't described until the mid nineties or so, even though it's really uh, ridiculous looking, but this Acrolophus, uh, one of, there's a whole group of these tube making moths, the grass tube moths are actually related to clothes moths uh, in the same family. Um, and uh, most of them feed on kind of dead grass uh, as caterpillars, but this one actually has been raised from, uh, reared from polypore fungi, so bracket fungi. Um, and you can see those crazy CD looks like kind of disheveled hair. Um, but, uh, there, this is from underneath. This one was on my window and I got a photo from underneath and you can see how crazy looking that thing is. Um, and the whole group this is another one of that species, but, um, the whole group here is a different species. They're just really wild looking. Uh, and they've, they've been really common this year actually. So. Yeah, I've seen a bunch of those myself. And those are mouth parts that are curling up over their head, right? Yeah, on that one, I think that's, those are uh, the the palps, uh, but it looks like they also have some kind of like fringes on their, on their thorax. So it's, uh, you know, I, I've never teased them apart. I just kind of take photos of them. So we had a few people in the chat say their favorite um, bugs and one person said anything in coleoptera so those are the beetles if you don't know that um one person said butterflies another person said spiders and then um jerry shared a observation of robber flies so let's pull that up really quickly i saw this picture that he posted yeah these guys are cool love robber flies they're, def they're definitely top top tier one of my favorites I feel like they've been very conspicuous lately because I've seen a lot of people posting a lot of photos of these asking what they are. So there yeah. appear to be quite a few of them out recently. And these are substantial flies. Um, as flies go, they're quite large. <laughs> yeah, the, these have been, it's a bit, been a big year for them too. And it's unfortunate because, I mean, it's great. I think it's great, but it's unfortunate because with the whole murder, murder hornet stories out, uh, we've actually been getting a lot of these sent in as people thinking they're murder hornets, yeah. um, which I should say are Asian giant hornets and obviously not a fly. Uh, so this is, unfortunately, people are killing these sometimes just because they mistake them for something, but these are really great. Uh, this is a really great species, um, very powerful, large robber flies that uh, there is one story online about them taking down a hummingbird which um, I don't doubt. I mean, they are very low. They're large specimens and they have venom. Uh, they could uh, probably at least take it down to the ground and, you know, who knows if they're successful or not. 
I've definitely seen these take down like large wasps and hornets. I don't know this species specifically, but definitely robber flies. They're very capable. Um, I have something I want to share for one of my favorites. Um, this is not my own observation. I just I found this online. Um, I love mantis flies. They're mm-hmm. super cool. Um, they're not related to praying mantis or not really the flies either. They're on their own group. They just look like a combination of the two. Um, they're one of my recent fascinations. I've seen a couple of them. They got some really good pictures. Uh, I really love mantis flies. They're, they're definitely one of my top favorites. Yeah. A lot of entomologists share that feeling. They, they're, they're superb insects. And I've been lucky enough recently to take a, you know, photos of a few genera and species. And in fact, at Moth Night a couple of years ago at Prairie Ridge, uh, found at least two species coming to the lights, uh, which was really nice. That's cool. Yeah, I found two species during um, National Moth Week this year at my home, which I was very excited about. Um, I'd only ever seen the, um, the brown ones. Is, um, Oh, I'm blanking on the genera. It doesn't matter really, but um, <laughs> but this year I saw green as well, so I was very excited. Yeah, I feel like the green one is fairly common. It's, it seems to be a little bit more common than the brown one. And then there's this very large, much larger one that looks like a paper wasp that is really widespread, but I, I have only seen it once uh, because somebody caught it. I was actually out visiting Michelle Troutwine, uh, Chris, at the Cal Academy, and uh, um, the world expert on Neuroptera, his uh, technician uh, found one in a pool, and so I was able to f- take photos of it. Luckily, it was really, it was a really beautiful insect. This is the one I saw in July. Oh, uh, the brown one. They're so cool. I love them. Well, here you go. I'll, uh, I'll show you that one. That other one. This is so. This is. Um, This is that one that uh, was out there. Again, it's fairly large. It's much more hefty than a lot of the other ones, I think. Uh, But as far as, I think this one, this one is one feeding and this one was from Moth Night, I think, of Prairie Ridge. Uh, Or it might've been from uh, the mountains of North Carolina, but yeah. But this one is really impressive. Here's another one. This is a similar one to what you were showing. But they're great, they're great insects. Yeah, also predators, so good things to have around. They eat a lot of other things we might not want as many of. And they have a really weird life history uh, because they're all either parasites or predators of of, uh, spider eggs or uh, as larvae. So it's crazy. Sometimes they'll just get in an egg sac, even when a mother's carrying it like a like a uh, wolf spider, and just eat all the eggs. All right. Well, we are going to wrap up here in a few minutes. Does anyone have any last lingering questions they'd like to ask or cool observations they'd like to share? Uh, I do. Well, anybody's typing in the chat. I do want to share um, a couple plugs. Of course, Bugfest is continuing today. You can visit naturalsciences.org um, and find more buggy talks. The link to Matt's talk later today. Um, it's going all day today, all kinds of insect stuff. Um, you can register for more activities. Um, and later tonight, um, we are actually hosting a um, porch light party um, virtually um, on Facebook Live at Prairie Ridge's account, Facebook account, um, where Chris will be looking at some black lights. We have a number of museum staff also looking under their porch lights at their homes. So hopefully it's not too cold (laughs) for some of these insects. Last night I still had a good number under my porch light, so hopefully tonight. Um, So definitely tune in. And um, you see the um, image here of the Bugfest shirts. We do have bug fest shirts. I'm wearing one today. They're quite comfortable. If you're interested in a bug fest shirt, visit our museum store online. They also have really cool natural science themed masks that you can get. Um, so really great resources if you go to naturalsciences.org. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us very early on a Saturday morning. Really appreciate it. Um, 
Thanks to uh, Adam and Matt and Bonnie for joining me in the uh, panel discussion today. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I hope all the rest of you enjoy the rest of your bug fest. Thank you all so much, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody.